I'm Chris Fowler and welcome to Sports Century. For more than half a century, the story of a great racehorse lay buried in the musty back aisles of newspaper and magazine morgues. Then a freelance writer suffering from a rare and debilitating disorder began researching the thoroughbred. And the more she dug, the brighter grew her interest. The result of her solitary labors was the rebirth of Seabiscuit, a little package of dynamite that not only ran fast, but lifted a spiritually bankrupt nation from its knees. Reinvigorating the legend of Seabiscuit stemmed in part from uh, a girl who didn't have the physical vigor to express herself in other ways. Whenever you have been through a great deal of pain yourself, you understand other people's pain. Seabiscuit appealed on every level to the American instinct for the underdog. And here it is, a half a century and more later, who chronicles this tale? Laura Hillenbrand, who suffers from chronic fatigue syndrome exacerbated by vertigo. It's the kind of fatigue that prevents you from being able to lift a spoon to your lips. And through the process of writing this book, there were times when she couldn't read, she couldn't write. Physically, it was extremely difficult, not just at times, but throughout. I woke up every morning thinking about it, and I went to bed at night writing it in my head. It was that much of an obsession. In March of 2001, Laura Hillenbrand's four-and-a-half-year labor of love was published. And like the horse pictured on its cover, the book shot to the front of the New York Times bestseller list in a month. When a major feature film followed in the summer of 2003, reflected glory fell on the great-grandson of the horse's owner, half a world away. Here I am rolling with a Marine unit into Baghdad at the end of the war, and I've got Marine colonels asking me, uh, hey, can you autograph my, my book here? I think our country's wondering what's going on with the world right now. It's very ironic that a horse that brought our country together 60 years ago is back sort of doing the same thing right now. Within a year of the stock market crash of 1929, there were four million people out of work, and the idea of uh, sports and entertainment Finding an escape was very appealing to Americans. At the time the Seabiscuit came along, American horse racing was probably at its peak of popularity, and the country was certainly in need of uh, heroes, human or equine. People needed him. Here's somebody we can identify with who looks as beat up as America is right now. Seabiscuit taught Americans, it's not your circumstances, it's not your history. It's what you have in your head and in your heart. Although Seabiscuit carried the genes of the legendary man of war who won 20 of 21 races, he seemed at best to be a poor relation of his grandfather, and at worst, a caricature. Seabiscuit's legs were too short. His, his neck was too thick. He was a big horse on little legs. He swung one foreleg out wildly like he was swatting flies. He had a mind of his own. He'd fight you. We're about halfway through the work, and Seabiscuit just stuck his toes in the ground, pulled right up just pulled right up he says i'm not going any further he was blessed or cursed with in horse terms a high order of intelligence he was like a juvenile delinquent a loser in his first 17 starts seabiscuit was not a candidate to run in the 1936 triple crown races deemed a bad risk the three-year-old was sold for eight thousand dollars under new ownership by a car salesman, the horse soon developed new wheels. After losing the $100,000 Santa Anita handicap by a nose in February of 1937, Seabiscuit won his next seven races and rushed to the forefront of public interest. It's Seabiscuit. He's number one in this Bay Meadows handicap, raring to show his speed as they get away for one mile and an eighth. Newsreels were fairly new, and the style of the day tended to glorify and glamorize their sports heroes. Seabiscuit was an incorrigible ham. When somebody raised a camera, he would strike a pose. Radio was becoming huge in the country. His races were broadcast. He was known to uh, people from New Jersey to Nebraska. Seabiscuit was the greatest sold racehorse in history. 
because the writers went out of their way to become hype masters and hucksters. He was, by newspaper column inches, the number one newsmaker in America in 1938. He had two lines of Seabiscuit oranges. There were Seabiscuit hats sold on Fifth Avenue. He was everywhere. World War II bomber crews would name their aircraft after this horse. It was something that galvanized a sense of stoic endeavor in their missions. Seabiscuit traveled tens of thousands of miles in his own modified Pullman rail car. Masses of people would come out to the tracks just to get a glimpse of the horse. Seabiscuit owed his fame as much to the promotional genius of his owner, Charles Howard, as he did to his legs. He would do things like send barrels full of champagne up to the press box. He even had his shoes pulled after every race and made into silver ashtrays, which he usually gave to reporters. He was just doing what he did naturally. He could sell Seabiscuit. He believed in that product as he did one of those earlier Buick automobiles. Beyond Seabiscuit's pounding speed and the promotional pump provided by Howard, there were two others, a mystical trainer and a broken down jockey who filled out a team that would bring the racing world to its knees. The unlikely trio that molded the career of Seabiscuit was led by Charles Howard, whose life had been shattered one dark day in 1926. The thing that turned him away from the automobiles that he had devoted his life to was the fact that his own son, his 15-year-old boy, was killed in a car accident on his ranch. It was a single car accident to roll over, and it was pretty badly, badly injured. There was not enough assistance there. Perhaps they could have saved him. It was a traumatizing time for the family. He was the apple of Poppy's eye, a big part of his heart. So there was some very long-lasting pain there. Charles Howard's marriage collapsed. He became a very unhappy grief-stricken man. He ended up discovering horse racing and falling in love with it. Before Howard purchased Seabiscuit, he hired a trainer, a loaner reputed to have not only an eye for horses, but also an ear. Tom Smith captured and trained wild horses for the British Cavalry. He had no sense of communication with human beings to speak of, but he did connect with horses somehow. We call him Silent Tom. He didn't talk idly to anybody. And... I was pretty good friends with him, but uh, if I asked him something, he didn't want to answer me. He just wouldn't answer me. Tom Smith was the horse whisperer. I think that's why they were willing to put up with his lack of social skills. That wasn't what his job was. His job was to train horses. Tom Smith was looking for a horse. Seabiscuit stopped right in front of him and looked at him. And Tom said he nodded at the horse and that the horse nodded back. And he said, I'll see you again. Soon to join the millionaire and the horse whisperer was an oversized jockey named Johnny Red Pollard, who was legally blind in one eye and had won just three stakes races in more than a decade. He always felt sorry for the underdog because he identified with him, of course. He only went to grade school, but the teacher told him he would never amount to anything. Somehow that, that just ate him up and drove him basically relied on literally fighting his way. You know, he'd get in the boxing ring and try to make a couple of bucks so he could eat. He did raise a lot of hell, you know, and I could just see Red Paul saying, you're going to go out tonight and get a little bow on juice. That was Red Paul. He was always trying to accrue intelligence from even books, reading Shakespeare. And maybe Red will see you and quote something. He had this dichotomy within him, this intellectual side and, and also this wild physical side, which he just had to uh, live in that body and live that way. Penniless and out of work, Red Pollard showed up at the Detroit Fairgrounds in August of 1936. There, he met Tom Smith's new horse and offered him a small gift that started a love affair. Seabiscuit at this time had been attacking everybody who came near his stall. But he kind of wanted the sugar, and he pressed his muzzle to Red's chest. And Tom thought, this is my man. They probably both suffered from lack of self-esteem. They had the same temperament, fiery and uh, ornery, and together they became elegant. Red Pollard understood that Seabiscuit may have been his last chance in life. And all of a sudden, he became a better jockey 
and Seabiscuit became a better horse. The jockey understood how to ride the horse, the trainer understood the horse, and the owner understood how to promote the horse. And as a team, they go on the wildest ride, maybe in the history of American turf. With Red Pollard in the irons, Seabiscuit increased his national fame by winning 10 of his last 12 starts in 1937. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, a big, dark three-year-old was building a reputation on the hollowed venues of the sport. War Admiral won his last 11 starts and has never been out of the money. War Admiral won the Triple Crown as a three-year-old. He won the Jockey Club Gold Cup at the time, the most prestigious race run for all the horses in the country. War Admiral was by Zeus out of Venus. Seabiscuit was by a foot soldier out of a handmaiden and they emerged full-blown right out of their pedigrees. War Admiral was pointed for the major events on the racing calendar, and he was expected to win those, and he did. Uh, Seabiscuit had been bouncing around all over the country like a barnstorming attraction. Charles Howard knew if he was going to conquer American racing, his horse was going to have to meet War Admiral head and head, and he was going to have to beat him. Despite the public's love for the little horse that could, Howard knew that if Seabiscuit was to be taken seriously as a challenger to War Admiral, he would have to establish his own reputation in the East. Howard was really a master at capitalizing on this natural rivalry between California, uh, which represented the future, and the East, which represented the past. Charles Howard wanted to prove to the world that the horse coming out of California uh, could be the equal of anything that ran in the East. He issued challenges to Sam Riddle, the owner of War Admiral. For a, about a year, he was pretty much ignored. Samuel Riddle thought he'd be demeaning his horse to have him meet a Western horse. Seabiscuit has the finishing push. Seabiscuit has the speed. He sets a new track record of 1 minute 49 seconds. Winner by three lengths. Bring on War Admiral, says Seabiscuit. Faced with Seabiscuit's Eastern success and Howard's headlines, Samuel Riddle agreed to the showdown in 1938 at Pimlico. The War Admiral's owner insisted that the horses would do a walk-up start. If Riddle thought he had negotiated an advantage, he didn't know Tom Smith. The thing that Tom Smith was going to have to do is train the horse to break as fast as he possibly could to actually change his running style. So he built a box out of redwood and telephone batteries. And he rang the bell and tapped that horse. And that horse, the first two or three times, didn't get it. After the second, third, or fourth time, he left her running. And it became like a Pavlovian response. The minute he heard that bell, he was gone. But if Seabiscuit was ready, Red Pollard was not. While working out another horse, he fractured his leg. Pollard's good friend, top jockey George Wolf, rode Seabiscuit on November 1st, 1938. Fanfare and ballyhoo, tension and argument. Seabiscuit's a five-year-old grandson of Man of War, the self-possessed co-star of this turf thriller. War Admiral's the prima donna, a four-year-old son of Man of War. Forty million people listened to that race on the radio. The racetrack was so crowded that 10,000 people stayed outside the gates, sitting in trees and standing on cars and rooftops to try to see the race. Announcer Clem McCarthy uh, was unable to get to his post, so he called it from the rail. FDR stopped a cabinet meeting to listen to the match race. It was an event that brought America to a standstill for a minute, 56 seconds. And they're off in the service of gold. And Torchy Wolf is up to put one Seabiscuit to keep him up. The consensus was that the way this race would be run would be that War Admiral would take the lead and that Seabiscuit would lay behind. And they're coming to me head and head. War Admiral on the inside. Wolf is driving Seabiscuit and Seabiscuit is outrunning him. People were astonished. My God, Seabiscuit is outrunning War Admiral. Prior to the race, George Wolfe had conferred with Red Pollard as to how to ride it. And Red said, once you get the lead, slow Seabiscuit down and wait for War Admiral to catch up. And it was a crazy thing to do. But Red knew that Seabiscuit ran much harder with another horse running alongside him. And there goes War Admiral after him. Now the horse race is on. 
And now War Admiral has a head advantage, and Seabiscuit's got a head advantage. They're going into that far turn. This is a real horse race, just what we hope we get. They're head and head, and both suckies trying. Seabiscuit leads by a length. Now Seabiscuit by a length and a half. George Wolf said, I saw War Admiral's eyes rolling up in his head, like he was in agony and pain. And then War Admiral's tongue flopped out of his mouth, which is a sign of being broken. Seabiscuit is the winner by four lengths. And you never saw such a wild crowd. I pick War Admiral, but I started rooting for Seabiscuit because I realized the impact it would have on racing. If a war ever won it, it would just have been another match race. Seabiscuit would have falsely been cast as a kind of pretender had he not won the match race. So it made sure that he was recognized not only as a national figure, but as a national champion. This horse didn't win every time he ran, but he won the very biggest one. Seabiscuit proved that he was the best racehorse in the world at that moment. Voted Horse of the Year in 1938, Seabiscuit stood atop the racing world. As one writer put it, he had turned War Admiral into a Rear Admiral. But the joy was short-lived. Rupturing a ligament in his leg in his next race on Valentine's Day 1939, the career of America's sweetheart was in jeopardy. You can look at the owner, you can look at the trainer, you can look at the jockey, and it's all about Seabiscuit. I doubt if anybody can name another good horse they were ever involved with. Once you do hit that lightning in a bottle, you want to try to find it again, but what you find is how hard it is to do that. Seabiscuit spent most of 1939 healing at the Howard Ranch in California. By his side was Red Pollard, his own leg still on the mend. Disappointed by his past failure at Santa Anita and by not riding in the match race against War Admiral, Pollard looked for redemption in the 1940s Santa Anita handicap. Red had invested everything in this horse. No one else would hire him. He knew that one little tap on his leg and he might never walk again. But he wanted that Santa Anita handicap so badly. It was worth the risk. Charles Howard was in a quandary. He didn't know what to do, you know, whether to risk losing the race by having my father ride him. Sometimes it's better to break a man's leg than to break a man's heart. There they go to a perfect start. At the break, it's Specify going to the front. A wedding call is second on the rail. Uh, Witch C is third and moving up between horses. Seabiscuit is fourth. Seabiscuit was caught in a pocket. Red was frantic to get out and he bent over in the saddle and he yelled now pops red's leg missed the other rider's stirrup by an inch and they went straight through took the lead never looked back seabiscuit is second and driving seabiscuit is making his drive a bold he's challenging for the lead it's seabiscuit and kayak it's seabiscuit under the whip now they're coming across the line of finish and it's seabiscuit away by a length of the corner when Seabiscuit did win, it provided vindication for Red Pollard. This was his biggest win on the horse. It was the crowning achievement of Red Pollard's career. After Seabiscuit won the Santa Anita, the indomitable seven-year-old retired with 33 victories in 89 races. His earnings of $438,000 set an American racing record. It's an extremely fulfilling story, but it's a sad ending. When Seabiscuit left the lives of those people, he left a void that was never filled. Red Pollard's story is the saddest. He ended up riding in the bush leagues again, in cheap little races, and continued to be injured over and over again. Even after he stopped riding, he worked at the track and sort of demeaning jobs, but it put him in the atmosphere. He shined the boots of young jockeys who never even probably heard of him. He would banter, he was very witty. But there was another side to my father that can sometimes even border on depression. I don't know what made him so sad. His body was just failing by the time he reached age 70. He ended up in a nursing home 
built on the grounds of the old Narragansett Park where he and Seabiscuit had once run. And he stopped speaking one day. He just didn't want to talk anymore. He would always say, you know, all soldiers never die, they just fade away, and that's what he did. More than three decades before Red Pollard's death at the age of 71, Tom Smith trained the 1947 Kentucky Derby winner. But his career had been tainted 18 months earlier when he was charged with using an illegal drug called ephedrine. Smith insisted he was innocent. He was ruled off the racetrack for an entire year. He sat out the gate at Santa Anita and uh, sat there ruminating and grew bitter. Tom Smith slowly slid into obscurity, which is where he came from. And uh, in 1957, he had a stroke and ended up in a sanatorium until he died. When Charles Howard's horse, Noor, won the 1950 Santa Anita, a reporter suggested that perhaps he'd found another sea biscuit. Sir, said Howard, there will never be another sea biscuit. Three months later, Howard was gone at 69, the victim of a heart attack. Three years earlier, Seabiscuit had taken his leave. Seabiscuit died suddenly of a heart attack at age 14. Howard had the horse's body carried to a remote site on the ranch and had an oak sapling placed over the grave instead of a gravestone. And he told only his sons where the sapling was. Seabiscuit didn't have uh, an ongoing legacy through his offspring, so he just kind of faded away. It wasn't that people forgot. It's just Laura Hillenbrand wrapped it all together and packaged it for another generation. People are drawn to it because there's a story of overcoming uh, tremendous adversity. This is the ultimate underdog story. I think everybody identifies with the underdog. They want them to win. They don't always do it in real life, but this is one story where they did. Before Seabiscuit was released in theaters across the nation, Laura Helen Brandt was invited to join President Bush at a special screening. Usually bound to her apartment by her chronic infirmities, the author made her way from Georgetown to the White House where she watched her alter ego on the big screen. She rates that summer evening in 2003 as the most exciting of her life. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.